Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning at Holborn West. Um, delighted to see you all, and if there are any visitors with us, lovely to see you too. After the service this morning, there will be tea and coffee served in the large hall through the back. Um, my first duty this morning is to read the official declaration of votes cast in the recent ballot um, in adopting the Aberdeen City Centre at West End Church's basis of grouping. Votes cast by Woburn West, 55, for the motion, 44, against 11. Mid Stockett Parish Church, 106 total votes, for 100, against 6. Queen's Cross Parish Church, 71 votes, for 71, against 0. Rubis Law Parish Church, 95 votes, for 85, against 10. And St Mark's Parish Church, 70 votes, for 63, and against 7. So the total votes were 397, for 363, against 34. And these votes have been verified by the Deputy Clerk, Cheryl Franken. Um, just an update on the donations to Christian Aid at the Harvest Service. The total was 535 plus we've got £96 to reclaim gift aid. So that's great. Thanks very much. And also, again, thanks for your donations to Instant Neighbour. The Kirk Session will meet this Tuesday in the Sanctuary at 7pm. Tonight's Jubilee is on Zoom and will be led by Alan Jackson. The theme this evening is Psalm 103. Verna will send out details to join up the Zoom. Now our organist Jamie is still on holiday, so I'm delighted to welcome back Gordon Hay on, to accompany us this morning. And our service this morning is going to be led by Jay Thomas our youth ministry leader. So over to you, Jane. Thanks very much, uh, Sheila. And it's good to be with you this morning. Um, over the past few weeks, I've had the opportunity to lead worship at Midstalket and Queen's Cross. And um, it's becoming a bit of a farewell tour over these uh, few weeks as I'm heading back down to Glasgow um, to take up a job uh, there. In just uh, a month's time. So it's good to be with you um, and have this opportunity to be with you this morning. And I'd like to add my own welcome to that of Sheila's. Indeed, I hope you find this a welcoming space, uh, whether you're joining in person or watching online later in the week, whether you've already had a stressful morning or whether you're feeling relaxed after a long week. Or maybe you're joining us for worship for the very first time, or even if you're a familiar with a familiar face. I hope you feel very welcome in this place. I invite you to join me as we begin our service with our call to worship. The responses will be on screen. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our eyes to see your presence. Open our arms to the embrace of community. Open our minds to the beauty of truth. Open our hearts to the joy of new life. Amen. Amen. We begin our service with our first hymn this morning. It's number 132, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
Let's pray. Holy God, unseen and invisible to our eyes, and yet present with us in all of creation, in starry skies and glorious sunshine, in oceans and mountains, in forests and fields of flowers, in animals and human beings. Your presence is also found in scripture, in the stories of men and women who came close to you, and who you came close to. And in those stories of those who strayed far from you, though you never strayed from them or us. Your presence is found most fully in Jesus, the man who lived and walked among us, and who revealed your great love for us. Lord, you did desire for us, Lord, your desire for us is that we focus our eyes and our hearts on you, to follow your lead. And yet too often, like those who've gone before us, we lose our focus and we turn away, focusing instead on all manner of golden calves. Lord, forgive us, as you forgave your people Israel. Help us to realise when we turn from you, and to make the effort to return back to you. Lord, the journey feels long. We get lost, we get fed up, we get weary, and we get fearful. Help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to find ways of supporting each other and helping one another to keep moving forward. And as a church community, draw us together in strength and purpose. Keep us hopeful and confident, humble and honest, silent and ready to listen for your still small voice. And so we pray together as Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. This in give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. I thought we could have a wee bit of fun this morning, and to save you heading to the opticians, um, I thought we could test your observation skills. Our ability to see is a theme that we'll track and trace during our service this morning. So there's a few videos uh, that I would like to show you, and I'm kind of interested to see whether our young folks will be better at this than some of the others in the congregation. I'm curious to see how well uh, you get on with these. So I'll show you the first video, and uh, it's a classic Who Done It scene. Um, so there's a, det a detective and he's trying to work out who's committed a murder. Um, so I want you to pay close attention to the video and see if you can spot anything that seems a little bit odd or unusual in it. So we'll play the first video. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take oh, her away. That's fine, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Did anyone see anything that seemed slightly unusual or odd in the video? Did anybody spot anything? He's not dead. He's not dead? Eventually looked his leg halfway through. <laughs> okay, so his leg moved. Okay, anything else well spotted? Uh, you have a front row seat, of course. <laughs> um, anyone else spotting them? That's well. I thought someone had a rolling pin at one point, but it's not there in the final lineup. 
pixel uh, web application web might have changed. Any other any other things that you noticed? Glasses might have changed? Okay. Well, we'll see how observant uh, you guys were. So uh, maybe we could, we could play the rest of the video and we could see just how many changes there were. 21. And uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> so I guess a bit like the video says, it's easy to miss something that you're not looking for. Just by a show of hands, how many people got more than five changes? Okay, so I, I guess we have to test your observation skills a little bit more with our second video. So it's the same kind of idea. Pay attention to uh, the footage and look out for anything that's out of the ordinary. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. Okay, if we're able to pause it there. Now, there's an opportunity this morning to be honest with uh, one another. Did anybody get the answer of 13? No. <laughs> well, well, well spotted. Did anyone else see anything unusual in the video? Maybe we'll just put our hands up if you saw anything unusual in the video rather than just uh, tracing it out. Did anyone see anything unusual in the video? Okay, in that case, you might be surprised by what happens next. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Again, it's easy to miss something that we're not looking for. And I guess, depending on how well you fared this morning, um, if you need a new prescription, come and see me after the end of the, of the service. <laughs> in both our readings today, there's an inability to see how things really were. That's true of us sometimes, as we get bogged down with life's inevitable struggles and heartaches, and we're left wondering where God is in the midst of it all. And that's something that we'll return to later in the service. As always, though, at this point in our service, we turn to one another to share the peace with each other. Obviously, we're still limited in how we're able to do that, um, but we can do that by raising a hand. Um, or if you want to sign the peace, um, you can do it this way. So, thumbs together. Peace be with you. So, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. So not only have we had an eye examination this morning, we've also had a bit of exercise to get us moving around, which is all good. Um, but we'll continue in our worship by singing together. Hymn number 462, The King of Love, My Shepherd is.
Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 14, the golden calf. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favour of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why would your anger burn against your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains, and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and will give your descendants all this land I have promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster that he had threatened. Our second reading from Luke's Gospel comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. And it's the familiar story of the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. So he got up and went to his father. But he was still a long way off when his father saw him, and was so filled with compassion for him, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you, sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is fine. So 
So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he is back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. For God's word in scripture, for God's word within us, for God's word around us, thanks be to God. We continue in our worship by saying together hymn number 555, Amazing Grace, at which point the offering will be brought. us and you continue to breathe life into us. 
You've given us so much. And, and it is because we recognise these gifts that you've given, that we now give you these offerings. We dedicate this offering to the work of your kingdom here on earth. May this collection be used wisely and diligently, so that your love may be known widely. And as we dedicate this offering, we offer ourselves too, for these gifts of money are but tokens of ourselves. Take and use us, that our hands may be able to reach out in service, that our feet may walk the difficult path of reconciliation, and that our words may be words of peace. For this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I've, uh, I've lived in a few different places in my life, and uh, how people react at the bus stop uh, often reveals a lot about the time. I spent four years studying in Dumfries and waiting for, bus, for the bus to uni that very first day. A woman waiting with me pipes up, You're not from right here, are you? Hardly the warmest of well, hardly the warmest of welcomes. My first day in Aberdeen, a fellow passenger gave me some sound advice. As I called the name of in the November sun, mine and half up. <laughs> I had to ask Google Translate for help. <laughs> in Glasgow, you tend to get people's life stories at the bus stop, stories of events and moments that are significant for one particular reason or another. It's amazing what some people are able to condense into five minutes. Perhaps a lesson for ministers and church workers everywhere. But I've really come to enjoy and value that way of connecting with people. So this morning, I wanted to invite you just in your own mind to begin to picture those significant moments in your life. It might be your earliest memory, a first kiss, a relationship, or maybe it's a day that you would love to experience and live all over again. As you think back, I wonder what you remember about those moments. And I wonder what you perhaps forgot about those moments. And think back to that moment in your life, or period of, period of your life, where faith in God seemed like something you wanted to explore further. For me, that moment happened at a church youth event during a time of worship. The older I get, the more cynical I become, so maybe I got caught up in the loud music and the emotion of it all. That God moved from being an idea or a concept to a personal presence. I felt like the pain and hurt I carried around for so long was being lifted. And suddenly God didn't feel distant or somewhere else, but close, here. And in that moment, I began to realise that God had been there in times of my life that I hadn't been aware of. Like Jacob realised in Genesis 28, God was there and I just didn't know it. Where God is and what he or she is like is something I've been exploring with peoples at Aberdeen Grammar. Over the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to lead a series of RE classes with first-year pupils encouraging them to create some artwork as part of the class. To help them create their own response to the question, where is God? I asked them to reflect on some further questions. Does God exist? Is he close or is he distant? Does he care about us and our world? What might we want to say to this God? And what might this God have to say to us? And is there anything that makes this God angry or sad? So I wanted to take just a few moments today to show you some examples of their work as we think about our own pictures and images of God. Our first picture, our first image will come up on screen in just a second, and it's by Ava. Ava asks, how are we to know if there is a God if we don't know what he looks like? Our second image is by Natalia. Natalia says, to see him, you just need to open your eyes. And our third image, 
Rebecca asks a range of questions. Can you see God? Does God care? Is God real? Where did God come from? She says there's a magic eight ball in the middle of her page, reminding us that some questions can't be answered. In her fourth image, William says, we all try and find where God is. Maybe he's real, maybe he's not, maybe he's a myth, but we just have to believe. In our fifth image, Logan says, there are times when it seems like all there is is pain and sorrow, that God is everywhere. God can be found in laughter, in nature, in adventure, and in beauty. In our next image, Sarah and Louise write, we have not answered the question, where is God? But we have suggested how to go about answering the question. Seek and you will find. But be careful. If God was at the touch of a button, would you dare click it? I wonder which of these images created by pupils you are drawn to. One valuable lesson I think the pupils teach us is that having more questions than answers is okay. In fact, sometimes our questions reveal more than our answers could. So when you hear the word God, what images come to mind? Is God the old man with the long white beard sitting on a cloud somewhere far off <coughs> that he's often portrayed to be? Is God like a shepherd, leading us a long life's journey, finding a safe pasture in cool waters? Maybe you like to think of God like that of a loving parent who delights in giving good gifts to their children. Or maybe, maybe God seems temperamental, prone to disappear in life's hardest and most difficult moments. As we read earlier, there are times in the Bible when he seems distant, and times when he appears angry, vengeful and jealous. From our 21st century perspective, today's passage from Exodus may seem like a challenging one. The notion that God was so prepared to destroy the people in a fit of anger and rage doesn't sit comfortably with our notion that God is love. It's tempting to remove this tension and discomfort, but we do well to remember that the moment God is figured out with nice neat lines and definitions, we're no longer dealing with God. It's the mistake that the Israelites make. They want to shape and mold God in their own terms. Perhaps though, this image of an angry God says more about the Israelites than it does the divine. Is it any wonder that this wandering tribe would understand God in this way after experiencing the brutality of slavery in Egypt, being exposed to the harshness of an unforgiving desert environment, and no doubt exposed to other belief systems where the gods would act in a whim, often seeming to lash out, and who constantly needed to be appeased with offerings and sacrifices. They must have been fearful, anxious, living not knowing what tomorrow would bring. And with Moses seemingly disappearing too, perhaps they began to feel like their venture was destined for failure, and like they had lost God's favour. It's not so far removed from our own human experience. When presented with life's challenges and when it doles out disasters to us, we ask those very same questions. Are you there, God? Do you care or have you abandoned us? When we lose people we love, when illness strikes at us, when relationships break down and it feels like the sky is falling in, we feel every justification and asking those very same questions of God. The Israelites had struggled to know that God was in their midst. By day, they had seen and followed a cloud of fine light called the fire. A cloud obscures vision, hiding its secrets within. Fire defies touch, 
creating distance between the God within and the people without. The hard part of the story that I find difficult to comprehend is that they'd witnessed the miraculous with the parting of the Red Sea. They'd eaten the manna and quail. The very food that they were told was how they would know that God was the one who leads them to freedom. But for so long they didn't see God, God face to face and they hadn't heard God's own voice. They asked questions of God by speaking to God's servant Moses. Moses became the middleman linking them to a hidden presence that eluded their senses. But throughout the entire journey and adventure, God heard their cry. He liberated them and led them safely from Egypt. He cared for them by providing food for the journey. He hadn't abandoned them or had, hadn't given up on them. God was very much with them. The truth of God's presence was evident. It just eluded their senses. Our second passage from Luke's Gospel is similar in that respect. There was a reality about their identity and relationship with the Father that both sons couldn't quite see. And we don't know why the younger son was unhappy, but he broke a huge cultural taboo when he asked to receive his share of the inheritance early. It was the equivalent of wishing his father dead. I imagine Jesus' audience gasping at the son's naked disdain for his father, or rolling their eyes at the folly of youth. But something equally sho shocking happens next. The father grants the younger son's request and gives him half of the inheritance. So with his pockets stuffed full of cash, the younger son packs his bags and heads off to a new town to make a name for himself. Inevitably, the son's choices cause him to hit rock bottom and he returns home in shame. His father forgives him and throws a party. The younger son comes to realise that there's nothing that can separate him from his father's love and that he will always be his father's son. Meanwhile, the older son refuses to come to the party because he doesn't think his brother is worthy of his father's forgiveness. He has mistakenly thought that it's his hard work effort that's kind of earned him his identity. But for all the words that Jesus could give the God character in this story, Jesus has the Father saying, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. You are always with me and everything I have is yours. In his book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, a Dutch theologian Henry Newman describes perfectly the beautiful image of God that Jesus paints with this parable. He writes, Here is the God I want to believe in, a Father who from the beginning of creation has stretched out his arms in merciful blessing, always waiting, never letting his arms drop down in despair, but always hoping that his children will return so that he can speak words of love to them and let his tired arms rest on their shoulders. His only desire is to bless. There's something else though in the parable that I'm drawn to, uh, this picture of God that Jesus paints. Jesus leaves the story unresolved. The father's words just hang there and we don't find out if the older brother decides to join his younger brother at the party. And perhaps that's one of the reasons that this story has an enduring resonance. It's that we all have things in our lives that go unresolved. Things that cause us hurt and pain that we all wish were different. There's always a party missing an older brother. Our understanding of God and who he is has to acknowledge and embrace the pain and brokenness that we often experience and observe. And our images and pictures of God must be big enough to hold God's abiding love and presence within the reality of life. And that's why my favourite piece of artwork created in response to this question, where is God, is this one from Nikki. Nikki says, newspaper cuttings from today's news with barbed wire. My way of symbolising war and suffering for the world. 
In the top left, there's a big tear in the fabric. And underneath is a bright gold. This is where I think God is. But about growing larger in the world and in our hearts. By letting this time to cover the whole image in gold. So may that be our prayer this morning. That God would forever grow larger in our hearts and the inner minds. And that he will cover his whole image and his whole creation in gold. Amen. Continue to sow division rather than peace. In these trying times, we pray for leaders and citizens 
each of us with a part to play. We pray for wisdom and compassion, for the ability to participate in the work of making the lives of all your beloved children better. Help us and all leaders to act in your name for the good of all. And today as your church continues to seek to do your will, we pray for boldness to face our challenges and to find a place where we can do good, and where our love can move from talk to the action of your work in the world. Today as we come seeking to hear your voice, to live your call, to ask our questions, to explore our doubts, we pray for ourselves that we might find each in our own way the path to the service of you and each other today and every day. Hear this in all our prayers, said and unsaid. Amen. Our closing hymn today will be hymn number 134, Bring Many Names. <laughs>
Thank you. 